So thank you so much for the invitation and uh, giving me the ability to come here and visit you and to give you my support to this university by me being present here and giving a talk. And hopefully that you can learn something new uh, from uh, Edwards and my lab. So we have heard about a lot of cells and uh, uh, how they work uh, and, and so on, but uh, what about the function? And, uh, oh, do you see the top here? Yeah. So we can use the space as a wonderful retrieval queue for our memories. And this is a technique that has been uh, known for ages and ages. And how many of you are using that for remembering boring things? No, none? <laughs> a few? So this technique is, uh, is well known. So this is just an illustrate, uh, illustration made by uh, Edwards and my daughter. Uh, and uh, she uh, made this uh, memory palace how to remember uh, uh, countries in South America. And not only the names, but also where they are in relation to each other. And then such a memory palace is quite useful. So you see, for example, um, Chile, and then my favorite uh, cue here in this memory palace is the Chile uh, wallpaper. And then you have the angry Tina, Argentina, and you have the dog up here, Boulevard. And then some of you might recognize uh, our supervisor, Pierre Andersen. So why is he here? Of course, he is Peru. And, and so on. And then in order to remember these countries, where they are located, you can walk in your private memory palace and pick up memories that you uh, have some problems uh, remembering. And this is why I think we are so interested in how our uh, brain is generating uh, uh, navigation and memory. And you've heard a lot about it this, uh, this uh, afternoon, and I'm going to tell you a tiny bit more. This beautiful structure at the right, you recognize as a seahorse hippocampus, and this structure is uh, the structure uh, taken out from a human brain, and you see why this is also called a hippocampus. And we know that if you don't have uh, two of these in your brain, you will have severe memory problems. You will also have problems to find your way. And this is exactly what we saw in the memory palace. You can use space to remember. I want to explore what kind of input is given to this beautiful structure in the brain and see if it makes sense if you think about the memory palace. So do you want to join me? on this journey deep in the brain and try to dig out some of the cells and the functions. We have, as Edward said, we have two um, parts of the enterino cortex, the medial enterino cortex and the lateral enterino cortex. But for you it's enough, sufficient to think about this is the input that uh, the hippocampus is receiving. And uh, both uh, John and Edward mentioned this beautiful cell, which is the grid cell. And that is then uh, providing the hippocampus with the metrics. How far do you go in what direction? And that's quite useful if you want to use space as, um, as a retrieval cue. Um, so, you have also heard that in the enterino cortex, we have cells that respond to what direction uh, animals or people are walking. So, if, I, if you record a head direction cell, 
that is responding to this direction in my head, and it's pop, 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 and then silence. And then pop, 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 silence. So these cells are quite useful when you want to build a memory palace. What's interesting is that in order to uh, get the grid cell that we have heard so much about uh, today to fire at these very, very precise locations, it's useful to know what direction you walk, but you also have to know uh, about the speed, because otherwise um, the fields would uh, show up in the wrong location. And then the question was uh, in our lab, um, then uh, addressed by a student, uh, a postdoc called Emilio Kropf from Patagonia in Argentina, South America. Uh, he designed a task in the lab where he could control the speed of the animal. So the animal was driving a car, but the animal had to run in order to not sleep, because they can't sleep, then we can't record here. Um, it would be a different um, uh, study. And in, uh, he could also control the speed of this car. And what you see here is just an example of uh, one cell, and these are when the animal is driving north, and these are when the animal is driving south. And you see these red dots, that is just pop, 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 pop. That is the activity of the cell. And you can just add up the activity of all these single uh, uh, laps. And then you get this red line, and that is the firing rate of this cell when the animal is driving. But do you remember that Emilio, he changed the speed of the car, and here suddenly the speed of the car, here shown in gray, is reduced. And you see immediately this cell is responding by decreasing the activity. And then when the animal is uh, driving uh, north, uh, or was this south, uh, then you see that the, 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 the car is slow and speeding up, and then the cell is responding. So it seems like this cell type is then a speedometer in the brain. And not only in these artificial situations, although you could think that uh, we would like to play so much with animals that they are allowed to, to drive cars all the time, they're also running in these boxes, as uh, Edward and, and, and John told. And when they have this spontaneous activity and they eat chocolate, that is their motivation for run around, when they stop, when they run, when they uh, have a, 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 a normal speed, you see that the cells, these 12 cells that we have illustrated here, they reflect the speed of the animal, even the spontaneous activity. And this information is extremely important for the grid cell, because otherwise, this cell, which is so deep in the brain that it doesn't have eyes or ears or a nose or anything, can't know where the animal is, but it needs input what direction the animal is moving, and it needs input about the speed. And then you get this beautiful pattern. And you can fill in the equilateral triangles because it's so perfect. And remember, this is biology. There are some other cells that uh, also give information to the hippocampus. And those cells, also located very close to to the grid cells, they are the border cells. And the border cells are quite useful because even if you are on a stage where, which is not so normal, you have to know where the borders are, otherwise you fall off the stage. These cells signal the borders or the boundaries of the environment, and they pick their own wall that they would like to, to signal. So one cell could be active at this wall, another cell at another wall. What is also important here is that if you give these um, cells another wall, like here, like Emma, 
she is then studying this wall here, you see that the cell is signaling this wall on the si same side. And if you stretch the wall in either the X direction or in the Y direction, this uh, cell is uh, signaling the wall. So by, by these cells, I feel that we are close to building such a memory palace. But the memory palace w needs these objects, our memories, our dogs, whatever. So where is this information coming from? We have some clues from another lab, and that is uh, Jim Kneerin's lab. He played also with the animals, and he gave them toys. So when the animals were just running in these boring boxes, he gave them such toys, and he just respond, or he recorded cells in the lateral and trinal cortex this time. Um, and he recorded the response of these cells when there was an object in the environment. And what you see is that all these white dots, that is where the object, uh, such a, a toy is placed. And you see that uh, cells are responding to such objects. Then we got a um, PhD student in our lab, and he removed the objects that he had trained the animal to recognize. So he would then train the animal in this situation. So this is the box, and then you have the Lego tower. And the animal was visiting the box, eating chocolate, and saw the tower. And then he removed it here, no object, but there's a response. So even though he cleaned this box, and this is, uh, this is another day, everything is different that day, and the object is gone, the trace is there. So the cell or the animal remembers where this object was. And then he could play. He could move this tower to a new position. And then you see there's a weak response, like uh, Jim Kneerman found. But the position of the tower from the day before, days before was also remembered. And you see that he can even make a grid cell pattern. So this cell type remembers the position of different objects in the environment. And if you want this cell to remember for a longer time, or to show this trace response for a long time, you have to train um, the cell for this object for some time. So these are all published studies. So now I'm just going to tell you about a new cell type. And we are not ready with all the figures because it's so new. We haven't taught that much about the story, but uh, our PhD student, Eivind Heydal, he is now in a cottage in the forest in Norway, sitting down and trying to write up this story. So Edward and I had a meeting with him yesterday, so these figures are really fresh. So what Eivind did was quite similar to what Albert Sao did. So, and and uh, he's also collaborating with Emilia. So he has mice, and he is then giving the mice opportunities to visit an environment where there is a toy or a, a, a Duplo tower. What is so special about these cells, and these cells are now in the medial entorhinal cortex, the sister of the lateral entorhinal cortex, is that these cells, first of all, they respond to the object, but not in this donut shape like you saw uh, Jim Knirim cells did, but they have a kind of field close to the object. And what is even more interesting is that these cells, the animal can turn around 
and have the object at the back. And the cell just knows that this object is at the back and will still fire. So it is this relational cell, so it's almost like social relations. Now you haven't heard me saying that, but uh, think about it. So what I even did here in this uh, first experiment was just to present the object to the mouse and then ask uh, how is the firing rate and where is the firing field located? And then he removed the object and then the response were gone. And then he put back the object and the field is placed in the same direction. So here you see the orientation of the field relation relative to the object and um, also um, the same firing rate. So then you can ask, is it so that uh, all these object vector cells that we decided to call this baby, are they only firing towards um, uh, the, the, the west side of the object? No, like all other cells in this structure, even though they have the same function, they have different properties. So head direction cells can fire to north, uh, 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 east, south, different cells do that. And here you have different cells that have different preference of what direction they would have the object. So that is shown here. So here, uh, even has recorded uh, more than 60 cells. So each cell is lined, lined here. Sorry, uh, you heard only half of my talk. Is that true? and then say, speak up, lady. So what, what you see here is that, um, that uh, these different cells, they have different preference for uh, what direction they are firing towards this object. And this is uh, counted here. And in fact, something that is a bit special is that it seems like these vectors, they come in, in, uh, in bouts of, of 90 degrees. So add, it's adding up from 90 degrees parallel to the walls. There's also difference in, uh, in um, how far away from the object the, the, uh, the cells are responding, but uh, you see that most of them uh, fire at a distance between 10 and 20 centimeters, around 15 centimeters. Is it so that these cells that respond so specific to objects with this special vector towards the object. Is it so that I also respond specifically to one object, that I have a preference of one object? Or are they, like other cells in the middle and rhino cortex, more like a universal map-based uh, response? It seems like because they don't care that much which object they um, are, uh, are um, seeing. So in this case, you have cell two, and uh, Eivin, he has uh, given them this mouse two different objects, and you see that when anim uh, whenever the animal is approaching this object, you get an object vector field here, and then approaching this object, you see that uh, the object vector field is, um, is uh, in the same direction. And you see here in this cell, you see that this, the, the field is always to the east side of the object. And here you see all these uh, different uh, uh, cell types. And so it seems like these cells are then 
um, uh, they, they, they might function as a universal metric for where the object is and how far and at what, which direction. We might wonder, since they don't care that much about the identity of the object, do these cells need um, that the mouse is seeing the object? So how can we control that? We can just turn off the light. And here is an example of some cells where Irvin turned off the light. So this cell, for example, has two fields, one to the left and one to the right. And when you turn off the light, you see that it's quite messy. So it, it has to see the object and it seems like uh, uh, it might remember part of it, but the response is not so sharp anymore. This one is a bit better, and this one uh, may be uh, okay, this one is okay, and this is uh, responding quite similar to the light situation. So this is uh, how he summed it up. Uh, Eivin um, made a directional index, that means just how sharp uh, and how selective is this uh, vector towards the object. And you see that when he is turning off the light, then this sharpness of the object vector field is very reduced. And these are just other measures showing the same information uh, and the coherence of these fields, how sharp the fields are, and also the mean rate uh, has been changed. Then you could ask, is it so that in order to respond to these objects, they have to touch them? And they don't. So what I even did here is to hang the object so that they couldn't touch the object, and still, it is an object that you have to think about where it is compared to yourself, and then um, you see that uh, they keep, uh, they keep uh, the object vector fields, even though uh, it's a hanging uh, object. And the firing rate is even in, in this cell, uh, increased when the, uh, when the object is hanging and um, the correlation is very, very high between the two situations. So, if it is a cell that is really responding to object, then it should respond to not only all objects, but it should respond to objects in all situations. So if you then present these object vector cells to an object in a new room, you would expect this cell to also respond to objects in this new room. And that is exactly what is shown here. So here are uh, a familiar situation and um, the uh, novel room, so the orientation of the object vector uh, is, uh, is uh, changed, but that is because these maps are subjective. So even the head direction cells and the grid cells, they might rotate when you come to a new room. But the important thing here is that, um, and that uh, they are active in two rooms and they, uh, they uh, rotate coherently. And as uh, Edward showed in, um, in one of uh, these movies, he said that uh, grid cells are found in uh, different mammals, and we believe that uh, that's true also for these other cells. So what I've tried to, to show you now is that 
hippocampus is sitting there receiving all these different inputs and even though we have oh i put this one here it should be up there sorry so we have typically the lateral entorhinal cortex responding to odors to objects here is where we find the trace uh, cells but the vector cells those that are telling more about the metric and relationships they are found in the medial entorhinal cortex. The important thing is that these cells then send their information to the hippocampus so that hippocampus can associate space with all this information about objects and other things. How, how far are we with time? Five minutes left? Okay, because then I just wanted to say one little thing, because if we say here bluntly that um, the activ uh, this information is linked in the hippocampus, how is this done? And then we have to go back to Hebb, and Hebb, even in the 40s, publishing his book in 49, suggested that our memories, they are uh, stored in ensembles of cells that are active. So you could think about one room in the memory palace represented by these cells here with the chili paper, for example, and other things that you would like to remember. And the way this, uh, um, this retrieval process is, is that if you see chili, then you activate some cells, but not all of the cells, but because these cells are linked with a process that we, we think they are linked by, by long-term potentiation so that the synapses are stronger, so that these are easily activated as a group, then you can retrieve the memory. So what is important here is to know that memory is not like a video or as a painting. It's a reconstruction. So that means that there is memories. Our memories, they are subject for interference, but they are also subject for many errors. And I can show you one example here how we think about the memory. This is the retriever queue. What do we remember here? You can't know, can you? Somebody guessing? What do we remember? Now we have two cells active. Three. Four. It's a bad, a bad example. <laughs> it's my dog. <laughs> Fado. So if you remember the first slide I showed you today, that was this picture of my dog. So, uh, the, the, the point is just that you have these ensembles of cells, and then you have the triggers, and the triggers could be space, it could be odors, it could be anything, and by having this trigger, then you activate the whole memory, like we saw here, the reconstruction. And then I just, I, I, I was on the plane and then I found these beautiful photos and I wanted to just say, my memory palace has space at least for these two girls and my dog and my lab. And uh, this is uh, the latest photo of our lab. And uh, as Edward said, there are a lot of people working in our lab and just doing this grid and head direction cells. It's a lot of people here and Marianne Nefin and Turkel Hofting, Hafting were the most important ones, and Stula Molden for, for, for the grid cells. 
and then Vega and Francesca and Trigve with the border cells and the head direction cells and so on. But the new stuff here was uh, even Heydal and uh, Emilia on Hamshite and Albert with the, with the tracers. And of course, Edward has been involved in everything and we get um, good funding at our institute. So I just want to say thank you. I'm very sorry that I was uh, so eager to tell you a story that <laughs> I had a microphone like that. I hope you got parts of it. And I wish you very, very good with the politics here in Hungary. Okay.